Uh, I will present a talk about uh, how to make your data in Erlang efficient and as small as possible and as fast as possible. Uh, this will be based on my uh, experience with the uh, BIM uh, low level details and I also try to implement some BIM implementations, make some BIM implementations myself with different uh, level of success. So uh, I will skip this slide quickly because it was before the presentations about me. And uh, this talk will be about data, Most, mostly data, I will just mention some performance. So when you make your module, you write your code, you mention some data values in it, you, you, you write some literal tuples, some strings, some nested lists, something you, you hard code in your program. Uh, these literals are saved in a literal section in your BIM file. So when you load them in, into the virtual machine, they are stored in a special uh, section of, of your runtime memory, which is called constant heap, I think. Uh, what's good about this, that access to these values is very cheap, and uh, referring to them takes only one word of your precious process memory. But there is a trap. When you do this trick, uh, you can use it, for example, to create literal uh, tuples with lookup <coughs> values. You can do quick lookups by index, like random uh, cho choice of names, of addresses, random choice of some values. You can uh, look up, I don't know, hexadecimal to decimal and so on. So use tuples, literal tuples are fast and efficient. But there is a trap. When you reload this mod module often, and you store this literal reference somewhere, garbage collector will copy these references values to your process heaps. And then it will reload the module. So you will potentially have a copy every time you reload and store it somewhere. So uh, this, this is not noticeable unless you have hundreds of reloads, so, but just be aware. Uh, and again, yes, the, this, the, these, these literals are a great uh, way to do to store big amounts of data in your memory and, and cheaply refer to it. A uh, few words about immediates. These are one of value types in an virtual machine. They are so small that they fit in one machine register. They can be 32 bits or 64 bits, depends what virtual machine you have. That's one word. That's the, the, the common name for uh, machine register size uh, value. That's one word. So the small integers fit there. Uh, local pits and ports, they are small enough to fit. Atoms, the indexes in atom table, and nil, nil value, this also, it, it, it has a special immediate value. So when you store nil somewhere in your program, it will take only one word. It's, it's an empty list, uh, and a, a virtual machine treats it as an empty list, but it's just one word. It does not take any heap space. Uh, a bit uh, more about immediates. Um, the not, not full word width is uh, available for your value. Uh, two bits are reserved and two or four more bits specify the type of value. And this also explains why integers that you put in your uh, machine register can be as uh, big as 28 bits on 32-bit machine because four bits are taken away or 60 bits. Uh, if you go any, any bigger, it will be automatically converted to big integer. I will mention it on a later slide, what, what dangers this, this hides. Uh, uh, that's the red one, the, 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 the caveat. Uh, when you have some counter in your very big table, for example, edge table or some database table, and this counter was integer, and it keeps growing, and everyone is happy, it takes one word, your memory is at some gigabytes, and uh, you see no danger, but then it reaches 28-bit boundary. It's, auto it, it's converted to begin automatically, and that explodes, begin to becomes uh, like three or four words of size, that's like triples your column size, immediately. So be aware of integers crossing this size when, when you have millions of them. Uh, also floats, uh, in Erlang virtual machine, floats are not efficient data type. They don't occupy one word. They are stored on, on the process heap, 
and that takes two or three heap ports, that's 16 or uh, 12 bytes, plus the, the reference to it because you need a pointer to, to point to the float, so don't, don't store a lot of floats if you value your memory. Uh, it's much more efficient to store as a fixed point or a, a natural fraction and divide by m, but yeah, well, you still have the possibility to use floats. Just remember they're not efficient. Uh, atoms, uh, I think everyone knows that atoms are not garbage collected, but they are quite handy. They occupy just one word of memory. That's just eight or four bytes. And they are very cheap to compare for equality. They are very cheap to compare to another type. But when you compare two atoms, it will compare the string representation. And that's not efficient. The best is, is the candidate, it just compares two strings of, of uh, atom names. And uh, also keep in mind that when you store atom in uh, network message or on disk, it will be converted to string. With the tag that on, on, on load, it will become atom again, but it's not efficient. So that, that may explain why some companies use integers instead of atoms in database keys. And this complication is just to save memory and save disk space. Box values. This is a general class of values that are too big to fit into one register, one machine register. So a uh, virtual machine creates a piece of memory to dedicated to the value. Value can be, I will mention them, the, the, they are listed below. And uh, the blue one is your value that you manipulate in your program. That's the pointer. The pointer to, to process heap that stores something. Uh, it always, except for the list, uh, box value always has one extra word, the red one. Uh, it always has the one extra word specifying what is inside. So list uh, cells are boxed values. They don't have this header, but they, we know they are always two cells. I will show it in the next slide. Uh, remote pits and remote refs, they are too big to fit in one reg register. They are placed on heap with several words occupying. Float numbers I mentioned before, it's like two or three machine words. Uh, they can uh, place in your heap as well, and big nums. Uh, also those small integers that accidentally grew over the limit and became big nums, they occupy heap space. And binaries, I will go in detail later on them. So these things are uh, consist of two parts, the pointer which you manipulate and the piece of memory, the, the, the heap re uh, space where your data is stored. Uh, lists. A uh, list element is always, uh, list cell is always two, 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 two cells, two, two words of memory. Uh, so the, the, the first one on, on the left and the right, first one is the value you hold in your variable, the, va the value you manipulate. It points to heap that has two, two words of, for the head and for the tail. So Erlang calls to head and to tail of the list, they are very cheap, they are efficient, and they are implemented as uh, virtual machine opcodes. So if you call HD or TL on uh, list value, that's, that's fast, that's efficient. Uh, uh, a proper list always has a nil as its last element, and proper lists are expected by most uh, uh, functions in Erlang, but you are not constrained to this. You, you, you can <coughs> freely place any value in the second element of uh, last element of list or second element of list cell. Uh, so improper list that does not have nil at its last element, it, it's a bit more efficient. You don't need to build a second cell to hold, hold the second value. You can just put two values in one cell. That's just two words of memory you, you use. And some libraries like dict uh, in Erlang, I think, they use this way of storing, or G gbdix as well. So some Erlang libraries also do it. You just need to keep in mind that uh, last element will not be nil, so you cannot stop on nil anymore in your loop. And storing as this is, is more efficient. So uh, list has property that it's forward linked. You can only go forward. If you store any 
uh, element of your list in any of your variables, from it you can only go forward. Uh, if you need to find nth element, it's on complexity. If you need to prepend to list this chip, because you just build a new list cell. You build a new list cell, you don't modify any more memory. Prepending is very cheap. Uh, and appending, you have to traverse the full list and find the last element to, to append something. The minus minus operation uh, is a product of n by m. Uh, it has complexity. The, the more complexity, the, the bigger your second argument is. So when you have to subtract two lists and second list is big, try to avoid minus minus and instead you can use uh, some better data structure like GB sets. Or probably ORT sets, but I'm not sure about that one. So it's fast on s if your right argument is small, but stay aware, uh, it can be slow. Plus plus operation, I just mentioned append is ON, complexity ON, because you need to find the last element to append something. And you need to rewrite from there. You need to uh, rebuild part of your list. And uh, flatten and reverse operations are cheap. I will mention it right here. So uh, again, the tricks I mentioned it, uh, you can use both, both cells of, of, of a list cell, both uh, parts, for, for storing a value. If you have just a pair, it's more efficient than tuple. It's also more efficient than a list of two elements, because a list of two elements will, will take two cells, there's four words in memory, and tuple will take three words in memory, and uh, x bar y, the improper list, will take just two, just two words in memory for, for two cells. That's the most efficient way to store a pair. Uh, reversing is cheap because you just need to copy it. It will naturally reverse if you just take from head and put it from to, to the head, it will reverse nat naturally. And uh, this, is, uh, this function is implemented in C. Uh, if you have any pointer to any list cell, the tail, uh, so if you have any member of your list and you reuse it, it, it will be efficient. It, so from, from your pointer to the end, it's never modified. It's always constant. So whatever you build uh, from it is, is also constant, so it's efficient. Uh, and also list comprehensions. Compiler is smart enough. This is the piece of wisdom from uh, Erlang Efficiency Guide. Compiler is smart enough to optimize list comprehension if you don't use the result. It will just drop the, the values. <coughs> it, it will turn into just a simple loop. Uh, a word about memory locality. This is important when you have big arrays of data, uh, so big that you uh, actually start noticing cache, cache latency and cache misses. And for processing big, big arrays of data, you are interested to have your data linear in memory, that uh, CPU is able to prefetch it and use cache lines more efficiently. So uh, when you build the list quickly in a loop, uh, there is very high chance that it, it will occupy contiguous memory block. That's good. That's if that's uh, a lucky coincidence, and it will be fast if you iterate forward. So your your CPU will be able to to predict this and and prefetch this this memory. And the garbage collector will attempt to 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 rebuild this if 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 he, even if you have list which is uh, has its cells uh, uh, thrown all around your process heap after garbage collect, they may occupy a linear block of memory. They will stay together and that is that is good for for your loops. IO lists. IO lists, uh, for those who uh, just know the name but never use them, please do. They they are a great way to, to manipulate strings and build more complex documents from parts of strings. And they, they are very similar to standard rope data structure. Uh, this is essentially a tree. In Erlang, this will be uh, pieces of, of, of uh, nested lists uh, which hold pieces of strings. Uh, why they're good? Because you don't need to rewrite and rebuild your string every time you want to append or prepend something. And uh, appending something to IO list is cheap, is O1. Appending something to a string is, is, is not cheap. You have to rebuild 
the, the whole string. And uh, why they are handy? Because most of Erlang standard functions take IO lists easily. Just have a quick look in documentation. All the sockets functions or most of the file functions uh, accept IO lists. And there are some, some helping functions to work with them. So you, you will not feel yourself limited when you manipulate IO lists. And they are much faster than a single string that you have to append constantly. So it's good for your program. It's, it's not just good for you, it's also good for your program. Tuples. Tuples are essentially uh, arrays that you can only write once. Uh, when you want to modify a tuple, it will be rebuilt. And uh, the first red, red block on, on, on the picture, the, 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 the one that contains three, is a box, box header. Tup, tuple is a, is a box on, on the heap. And it contains the size, the arity, how many elements are in, tu in tuple. And for compatibility reasons, it's limited to 32 bits uh, world. So 26 bits is the biggest tuple you can build. That's if uh, you, you probably all know that 24 bits is 16 million. From old times, the display colors were 16 million. That's 24 bit color. And the 26 is just four times that 64 million at most you can fit in, in a tuple. Even, in, uh, even on a 64 bit machine, even because uh, though your bigger word size allows you to have bigger tuples, it's limited to 26 bits. And there's another example of more complex tuple where we have another nested tuple. They will occupy two boxes in memory. And if you build them together, they will most likely stay together. So accessing them will be cheap and fast. Uh, or if you build them from different parts that come from elsewhere, may, from some deep nested function call, they may accidentally occupy different places in memory. If that's a tight loop that runs millions of uh, iterations, you, you may notice <coughs> some, some difference in, in, in runtime. Uh, when you copy a tuple, the virtual machine will make a copy. Unless it uh, can uh, notice the pattern in your code, that, 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 uh, that kind of pattern in, in, in the smaller letters is uh, how compiler creates tuples. It creates a, uh, an empty block on memory and fills it in descending order with values. When compiler sees this, it will optimize uh, this code to modify the same copy of tuple, and at th this moment it becomes effective, efficient. Uh, also, a note when you use records, and when you modify a field in a record, it's also a tuple, and uh, try to avoid modifying deep nested record members, because it, it will incur modifying all the path from the, your record to containing record to, to containing record above it, and so on. And try to keep your modified data members as close to top as possible to make it uh, do less copying. Uh, tuples are really fast to build and read. That I mentioned before. It's compiler is able to optimize this. Uh, when it not notices, but I think you can uh, simulate the same behavior in your program and it will recognize it and also optimize it. Uh, if you modify this end in order and you don't do anything with the tuple until it's finished. Uh, when you have a big tuple, uh, because it's array, it's convenient to have your constant data in a tuple, uh, but, but when you have a big tuple and you need to do more manipulation than just changing a single field or single element, you may consider converting it to a list. It will grow up in memory a bit, but you get much more uh, instruments to, to, to work on it. Uh, and memory locality is, is perfect because they, they, they are allocated a single block of memory. You don't need to worry. And garbage collector also will attempt to drag all the uh, referred values together with the tuple. When you run a garbage collect, your tuples will group with their values, their elements and nested elements, and so on. So when you 
store something. It's just just an outcome. Just uh, when you store something with many many nested members, you you can run a force and one garbage collect to make it behave better. Uh, I don't have much information on maps <coughs> because they are fairly new and it's I didn't go into the source code to dig on them, but they they uh, they are stored in two different ways. Depends how many elements a map has. Uh, if it's too smaller than 32 elements, it's stored as a list of key-value pairs. I think it's sorted for 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 searching reasons. But if it becomes any bigger, it's converted to to a hash array tree. Uh, they are slower than records, of course, because you, you have to do more lookups than just index read or index write. Uh, but the good part when you have this hash array tree, try, uh, and you modify uh, some, some key in it, it will rebuild only path to the root. It will not modify all the all other branches. So this is sort of all sort of efficient. It's much, much better than rebuilding the, the whole stru full structure like you could in GB trees or GB sets, and uh, there is a trap here when you use maps as a state in your gen servers or in your modules. Uh, they are very convenient. It's easy to add keys. It's easy to match. It's you can even spec types on keys and values, but uh, you have to control yourself manually to not add any extra keys in the runtime because then it becomes quickly be runs out co of control and begins uh, uh, problems appear it, it gets harder to track where you added this key and where it was modified and, and why why it even is here so it it in, it relaxes the discipline that you had with the records uh If rules, a few rules, uh, when you have data copying in, in, in the Beam virtual machine, that uh, dashed line is, is the invisible border between your process and uh, add sports, uh, other processes, or binary heap. When your value crosses this line, it will be copied. So when you send a message, it will be copied. When you spawn a process, arguments will be copied. When you Uh, interact with ads or deaths or a port, it will be copied, except the binaries. And on binaries, on next slide, binaries have some tricks to, to, to optimize passing data. A simple example of a binary, uh, as much as I remember, there was a second uh, header word to specify byte size, and probably it also can specify uh, last byte for bit strings, because bit strings have incomplete last byte. So I think it also goes in that second word. And that's how a binary of five bytes is stored on, on, in memory. You have something like uh, headers stating that it occupies two words. There's a mistake. It should be three. Uh, three words binary. This header that says how many bytes. And the, the, there are go, go byte. There is no termina terminator like it would be in C. Uh, there are four, uh, probably five types of uh, manifestations of binaries in your program. They all look same in your Erlang syntax, <laughs> but they, they are stored differently for uh, optimization reasons. So uh, imagine you create a one large binary that's bigger than 64 bytes, this magical threshold in a virtual machine source. So anything that's bigger than 64 bytes goes onto a separate binary heap. That's a dedicated place in memory where all big binaries come to live and die. Uh, to, uh, to, to indicate that you own it because you created it, you get a blue one on top, the heap bin, or the, the, the proc bin. Uh, that's the pointer to binary on the binary heap that you own, your process owns. You can manipulate it, you can pass it around, you can send it as a message, it's small. It's just a few words of memory. And it holds a reference to the main body of data. When your process does garbage collect and notices that it's no longer used, it will die. And if reference count reaches zero, the big binary on the right will also die. Now there is a trap when you start sending 
the binaries between multiple processes. I will mention it on the next slide. So, and then heap bin, the, the, the top one, the, the blue one, is when you have a small binary that can fit in your, in your heap and uh, will not slow down your data processing. Uh, they are smaller than uh, 8 words of memory, 64 bytes, and they are completely uh, contained in your process, and they, they are copied every time you, you pass them around between processes. And there is also sub-binary, the orange one on the below. Sub-binaries are produced when you call binary colon part, and also th there are binary match objects. Uh, I know less about those, but they are created when you do binary match or binary search, I think, as well. So they, are, they behave like sub-binaries. They refer the bigger <coughs> binary, they say, from this position to this, posi this position, this is the data. Now, a uh, compiler is able to optimize uh, chain manipulations on a single binary. <coughs> if it is able to prove that binary is only ours and that it's not sent anywhere in between, if you have, if you created a new binary and you do a, li a row of operations on it, it will be optimized to, to, to happen in place. So, as long as you don't have, uh, don't share it, this on the next slide, as, you, as long as you don't share it with anyone in this <coughs> moment, it will be optimized. Also, when the uh, compiler processes uh, pattern matching, and you have, in all clauses, you have uh, an unused underscore variable. Uh, compiler is able to find it and uh, skip processing it uh, completely. So this will be, this part will be efficient. And you can see which optimizations are used if you have this highlighted compiler option or uh, set a flag. Compiler will print what happened to your binaries, what it was able to detect and optimize. So uh, the, 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 the famous trap with sharing big binary between multiple processes, uh, because when you do this, it will only share that the prog bin, the, the, the dark part, uh, when you send it to different processes. But every time you copy it, the reference count will increase, and processes will, will store it until uh, all prog bins are collected by garbage collector, then, it, then only then it will be able to reclaim the memory. Uh, also pay attention when you grow a binary. Uh, it will copy in these three situations. When the binary is sent, when you ma manipulate the binary and send it as a message in between, it will create a copy in, in memory. That's, that's like you, 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 break, you break your optimization, so move your sending to the end of, of uh, operations on a single value. Uh, when you insert it into ads, it's the same case, you, a copy is created, then this copy will remain in your memory. And when you do a binary match, it will create a list of matches that are uh, effectively sub-binaries holding reference count onto the main body of data. So when you have a network server that processes a big stream of data, uh, you want to keep an eye on where your sub-binaries go and where you send copies and, and uh, who holds the reference, so the memory will be freed eventually. Uh, that's here. Uh, performance on ads, uh, ads copies all the data you put into it, and it also copies all the data you read from it. So having uh, really big rows of data in ads or really big values is expensive. Or maybe imagine you have a big row, big data structure in each row of your ads table, but you modify only a small piece. In this situation, you may consider creating a second table and placing mutable field there to avoid copying the, the full thing out and in all the time. Uh, it is also, it's, it's efficient to store atoms in ads because they are in memory, they share your atom table or your virtual machine, they store, they only occupy one word of memory. But when you write it on disk, it explodes because all atoms are represented as strings. So remember this, don't, don't write many atoms to network. It's bad for your network. And external term format, it was, uh, it's created when you call term to binary. 
Uh, it's also used in uh, cross-node communications, and it's used on, in DETS on disk in, by Mnesia and by, <laughs> by, by React as well, and programmers use it when they store binary blobs in databases. But uh, yeah, the, again, the Atoms node, remember, they get converted to strings. And it's also it's CPU intensive, but since like 17 or 18, the Erlang 18, I think, they, they, they made it uh, term to binary uh, less, uh, a bit slower, but it can now, it will not now block your, your scheduler. So when you uh, encode the gigabytes or, or ma many megabytes of data, it will not block your CPU. So this part is well done in recent couple of Erlang versions. And the last slide, uh, it's less, uh, it's more performance than data. So local function calls are fast. That's when you call something <coughs> in your module without mentioning the module name. That's the fastest. When you mention a module name in your call, it becomes external function call. And this incurs a lookup in module table, and that's uh, three times slower. And when you do apply call, it also, uh, Apply calls are rewritten as a module colon function call with variable names instead of atoms. Uh, then it also incurs a function lookup. Look so it, it does double lookup and then it's six times slower. And when you create a closure, when you cr create a lambda inside your function that captures some values from your function, it, c it, could be, it could be a binary. It could be a big binary that just arrived over network to you and you created a lambda that, that captured this value and stored it somewhere in memory. And this means it will hold this data for a long time, possibly uh, blocking the garbage collector from reclaiming the, the binary memory. So keep uh, an eye on what your lambdas capture. They may take some, some uh, valuable resources and hold them forever. And uh, yeah, they behave like they have an invisible arguments that these uh, distort values are passed as invisible arguments to, to, to lambdas. And that was it. And thank you for watching. Okay. Who has a question for Dmitro? No. Was it so, so shocking? <laughs> So, uh, my question is like, all this stuff, uh, it's amazing, really interesting. Half of it I knew already, half of it was absolutely new for me, as well as probably many people out there. And while writing our code or reading someone else's code, we can notice things like that and try to optimize them. But the most often problem that I encounter, at least, is when I have existing system and it has performance issues. And many of them are because of things like this. How do you go about profiling airline code? Well, no, I, uh, no details, but just like if you, if you have some general guideline on how to, uh, you have an airline program and it's slow, and you suspect that it probably has one of those things. Yeah, but this, this should come as the end of your investigation. You begin, for example, you don't know, you have no idea what's happening. You, you play some metrics. You do some time RTC calls in your code. You, you graph them. You see some spikes on graphs. Or maybe you just notice that this takes too long. So when you dip, dig deeper, you, you time RTC again, then it becomes too small for time RTC. Eventually, you, you, you notice that this is not right here. So okay. then, you, then you come to this point where your data is wrong. or Maybe it's right, but it could be 100 times faster because cache miss is, is no joke in CPU. Okay, so there is no magic there, just no, re regular profiling drill, regular debugging. Yeah, yeah, you begin like you regularly, okay. like, like you normally do, but you come to, to some piece of code like this that has one of these data problems. It's not even problems, it's just less efficient data structure. or. Or maybe it's, it's, it's just spread in memory that memory locality is broken and you have like three times slower code. No, what I meant is that like, for example, binary heap, you can detect uh, that something is wrong with that by looking at airline call memory. And then it will show you that you have huge binary heap. And that probably points to something if you don't expect to, that your system has 
huge binaries. I was more referring to uh, tips and tricks like that, if you have any. But uh, okay. Yeah, well, this this one. Thanks anyway. We this can monitoring. talk about it later. Thank you. Okay, another question from Joe. Will you throw the ball? Oh, I don't. <laughs> I'm gonna be careful. A second time. It's it's soft. It it, it can. Actually, actually, it's just a well, few comments. But one was I think you should always measure because performance estimation is just about the most counterintuitive thing on the planet. Because I mean, you haven't just got one process; you've got all these other processes doing things at the same time, and. Uh, in answer to your comment, I'd say, you know, when you design a program, if, if, you, if you make an abstract interface to, that doesn't expose the underlying data structures of, of what you're doing, and you just use the most inefficient algorithm possible to do it, and then you measure, and if it turns out that that's not good, then you can just swap it with another module. So deliberately, the, the interfaces to, to several of the LA modules are deliberately chosen so that you can swap dicts to ord dicts, and your program will behave exactly the same. Uh, and that's deliberate. So, so the, 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 the moral there is, you know, choose the shortest and most beautiful and most elegant code first and then measure. And, and then if it's not efficient, then, then go in and change that, keeping the same interface. And, uh, and then if you're, if you're an old man like me, just, just wait. Um, Ten years gives you a factor of, I mean, still things are getting faster at a rate of about 15% per, per year. So if you wait 10 years, it'll be a thousand times faster. If you wait 20 years, it'll be a million times faster. So um, <laughs> the Erlang now, if you measure it, is several million times faster than the original one that I wrote. Um, and, it's, it, and it's not due to the cleverness of, of the implementation of the virtual machine. If, if you look at the ratio of clock speeds, the the... the I think that today's Erlang is about six times faster than the original one. And all the other gains come from increased clock, clock speed. So, I mean, really clever programming has improved the performance of the VM by a factor of six. Increased clock speeds has increased by a factor of, of several million because when it was done, 1.6 megahertz was fast. And now they're running at three gigahertz. So, I mean, there's, there's no way that you can do that. The other thing about optimization is programmer time costs an awful lot of money, and just throwing, throwing new processes in it is much cheaper than the number of hours to optimize it. So, in, in fact, it, it's, it's, it's just not economic to spend programmer hours on optimizing code rather than just, you know, buy a, buy a, you know if, if you have performance problems and you're in a company as opposed to research, just buy a 24-core machine because it's cheaper. You know, that is equivalent to a few hundred hours of programmer time and that few hours of programmer time can at most give you a factor maybe five or six, but the hardware will give you a factor of 24 by going from one core to 24 cores, and it's much cheaper. So it's all economics, actually, and, and patience. Just wait 20. Hey, you wait another 20 years, it'll be another million times faster. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Can anybody top that? <laughs> Any more questions? Okay, thanks, Mitra. So, I'd like to thank all of our all of our speakers, Melinda, you one, <coughs> Mitra, and Magda and Elspeth. Is she out there uh, for organising this? And Klarna Bank, of course, for being our hosts. Thanks a lot. Uh, now we all meet outside, food and drink, and we can talk. Thanks a lot for coming.